Susie, I couldn't wait to see you. I've just come from a meeting in a building where I went to the loo and there was a notice on the door that said, toilet out of order, please use floor below. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. I am Giles Brandreth. You are Susie Dent. This is Something Rhymes With Purple. It's our weekly podcast all about the wonder of the world of words. And... We try to give ourselves a a loose theme for each show to think about before we get here. And words of a feather is the phrase you came up with this week. Hmm. I remember Birds of a Feather. I loved that sitcom. Did you? What are Words of a Feather? Uh, Words of a Feather, well, obviously, as you say, it's a riff on Birds of a Feather. Um, That's a proverb that's about 500 years old now. Oh, you mean Birds of a Feather flock flock together? Flock together, exactly. So Ah. it was just lots of uh, proverbs that riff on a similar theme. But this is not about birds today. It's about double acts. Do you think that we have worked together long enough to be called a double act? I hope so. Okay, I I would like that. Uh, Someone's bringing us tea, which shows you that we are recognised as a double act. Somebody actually comes into the room and brings us tea. We're, we're, come on, See, that's it. Who's it going to be bringing us tea today? Oh, it's a, a, a young person. Hello. Hello. I'm Giles. This is Susie. Hi, Giles and Susie. And who are Hello. you? Thank you. I'm Grace. Very Hello, Grace. Grace. Hello. Now, Grace is Thank a little you. girl who didn't wash her face in another old poem. <laughs> really? Monday's, which child is full of Grace? Sunday's child is full Tuesday. of... Tuesday. Tuesday. I was born on a Tuesday. There, there you, you go. Are. Is that why you were called Grace? I hope so. Oh, Tuesday's <laughs> child is full of Grace. The what is the rest, how does the rest of the poem go? Uh, Monday's... Uh, Wednesday's child is full of woe. Thursday's child has far to go. Friday's child is... Oh, oh, Bonnie and Blythe. Saturday's child is meek and mild. But Sunday's child has furthest to go. Sunday's child is good. I know, I think that's great. I think that's the to me. Anyway, Grace, thank you so much for bringing us our lovely cups of tea. (laughs) This is because we're actually, sometimes we record the podcast at Susie's home Mm -hmm. in her lovely kitchen with her nice garden and her cat. Um, Mm -hmm. But today we've come to the Something Else Studios, which is basically the podcast capital of the world, because Something Else are the people who create all the world's best podcasts. And that was Grace, who's clearly one of the team here. I, I'm sorry, but I cannot finish this without going through that poem. Monday's child is fair of face. Tuesday's child is full of grace. Wednesday's child is full of woe. Thursday's child has far to go. That's me. I never knew how to take that. Friday's child is loving and giving. Saturday's child works hard for a living. But the child who is born on the Sabbath day is bonny and blithe, merry and gay. Yay. There you go. There we are. That was going to really bug me if I didn't get this one. So mm. I've just hit my microphone by fist pumping you, Giles. Uh, double acts. Double acts. Now... Since you mentioned situation comedy and double acts, Mm. one of my few claims to fame is that many years ago, I wrote the scripts for the sitcom of a double act. The double act were two guys who performed as women. They were called Hinge Hinge and and Bracket. bracket. Right, I knew you were going to say this. You wrote wrote their first sketch. Dame, well, not their first sketch. No, I wrote the TV series. It was called Dear Ladies, and they created a world. Patrick Fife really created the world of Stacton Trestle, this village where they lived. And it was them chatting away, being reminiscent. And it was great fun writing for a double act. How amazing. So I think we are the hinge and bracket of linguistics. We are the verbal hinge and bracket. Well, funny you should say that, because obviously we're here to talk about words um, and language. And so I thought a nice theme for um, one of our podcasts would be words that are siblings in language, but that you would never really think of putting together. Give me an example. So I'll give you an example. A mortuary and a mortgage. I mean, some people might think paying off your mortgage might put you in a mortuary. Mortuary and mortgage. There's a Mm -hmm. connection. Is the correction the M-O-R-T, which means death in Latin and in French? Yes. Mort. Yes. So we know that the mortuary is the place where you end up on the slab before they put you in the coffin, before they put you in the ground or the furnace. The mortgage, the gauge part is a kind of debt or a commitment. A pledge. A pledge. Like a bet. I mean, if you, gage in French is a is to place a bet. So that's your bet until you die is your mortgage. Gosh, have you paid off yours yet? God, no. no. What a long way to go. They go, they go on forever. <laughs> they go on forever. And then you have to remortgage to help your children get their houses. Dave, yeah. lovely. And, and then, you know, eventually. And then you have to sell your own property and mortgage it again in order to pay for your old folks' home yeah. or your care when you're so... You mean, basically, we are in hock 
which is another word. What's the origin of hawk? Hawk. That's I think relating to hawk. Related to hawk. I think it goes back to pawn shops. P a w n. I should say. Yeah. Quickly, mm. uh, which brings us back to the pledge bit. Oh, I'll go mortgage. Yeah. Give us a mortgage, you know. and we'll go back um, to hawk in a minute. Okay. It uh, so. It's a death pledge, essentially. Not because it pays you, it kills you to pay it off, but because if the borrower doesn't honour the pledge and pay what's due, the property will be dead to its owner. In other words, it will be forfeited. So a bit sinister, isn't it? It's very interesting the way in this country we are hooked on mortgages Mm -hmm. and hooked on home ownership. In other countries, People rent much in a much more relaxed way. In Germany, for example, renting is quite normal. Oh, absolutely. And with cars and nowadays... in New York and, yep, yep wherever. Young people uh, rent their cars. They don't buy them. People of my generation are the only and people now who them. buy cars. Yeah. Young people lease cars. Mm-hmm. Uh, people of my generation, we were brought up to buy... You had to buy your home. You had to own your own home. Mm. And that, of course, was very much encouraged by Mrs Thatcher and her conservative government in the 1980s. We've all got to own our own I homes. I think we still... I think the nation is still obsessed with owning their own home. And for some people, it was a big boon because in the days of high inflation, if you owned your own home, inflation pushed the value of your home up but in fact, what you had to repay didn't necessarily go up, except it may have done if it wasn't a fixed interest rate. Uh, so uh, maybe we're just over-mortgaged and over-obsessed with mortgage. Mm. I mean, you, you have a mortgage. You need to you... deleverage. I do have a mortgage, I mean, yes. But your eldest daughter, who's almost old enough to leave home now, mm-hmm. she's, is she going to uni? She's going to uni. And will she get a flat there? Will she rent a flat? Uh, I don't know. I think she'll be in student accommodation. Digs. Student digs. Well, was that digging in, I suppose? <laughs> no, it goes of... back to um, old um, gold digging sites. So in the gold rush of California, for example, digs would be, um, first of all, the accommodation was literally dug out of the ground and then eventually it encompassed all the various facilities that kind of, you know, were created around them. So it's literal digging um, in unpopulated land that surrounded gold fields or gold mines. If you are in hoch to somebody, what is the yeah, origin of that? Yeah, actually, just looking it up in the wonderful Oxford English Dictionary, it's not very clear, actually. It goes back to a French hoch, so maybe nothing to do with hawking and pawn shops, um, which was my guess, but we don't really know, to be honest. Uh, it was the name of an old card game in which certain privileged cards given to the person who... It's all very complicated. I don't think you want me to read that very long definition, but it was an old card game played in the 18th century. Perhaps. So it's something to do with maybe gambling? Yes. In hock? Yes, it's I'm the same sort of idea you. of a pledge. Yeah. Yeah, so forfeit. So you're saying that mortuary and mortgage, two unlikely words, but they're related. Yes, how about mouse and muscle? Mouse and muscle. Mouse. Now, flex your biceps. Show me your biceps. Uh, which are my biceps? These are, are these my... Oh, yeah, these? Go they're, on. They're little... Giles is really casual for, for Giles. This is, this is not really the, what I would expect. He's wearing a very loose-fitting... Check shirt. I associate it with suits and ties. I got into this day. when I was doing that thing a few weeks ago, months ago. I'm still flexing your biceps. Like uh, okay, uh, since I can, I will. I did this uh, celeb- celebrity goggle box with my oh, friend. Yes. Oh, my she, goodness, you're working uh, out your biceps uh, in case you need to be on the celebrity version. Yes. Of uh, Naked Attraction. Uh, well... <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't going to say that. I was oh. saying I, I, we sometimes watched in our gym jams and kimonos. Yes. So that's when I got into the idea of wearing something more loose fitting. Ah. So because it's summer, I thought Very I'd cash. wear a loose fitting shirt. But I've got my okay, so look my at your biceps. biceps. Can you just they have a look and like little ripple mats. them a little they're, bit? They're, 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 I am rippling them. You can't <laughs> see anything because nothing's happening. It's heartbreaking. No, okay, just. Do, I'm doing and then it. Relax and, and relax then, and have a look. In what shape can you see under your arm? Look, look at that movement. There is quite a lot of movement It's a beautiful movement. There. What's happening? What's, okay, well, what, it, does it happening? possibly look like a little rodent scuttling under your skin? Oh, you mean like a little mouse running yes. up the, my arm in so, my muscles? To some ancient anatomist, um, that kind of rippling bit of flesh there must have looked like a scurrying little mouse because the Latin for a little mouse is musculus and that eventually is where we got muscle from. Oh, that's amazing. It's cool, isn't it? So the word muscle, as in your muscles, oh, he's big muscle and muscular. is a little mouse. Is a little mouse. Yes. That puts us in perspective, doesn't it? We talked about kimonos. What about negligés? Negligé. That's a, a French be word. That to negligent. Negligé is a French word for meaning almost nothing. Yes. Uh, she's wearing her negligé to almost nothing. It's negligible. It's uh, virtually nothing. It's a little flimsy je ne sais quoi. I, I picture it uh, usually in black. 
but virtually see-through. I, I imagine you picture it quite a lot. <laughs> Uh, OK, well... Do you have, speaking of which, do I, have I, a I would if you have a negligee. No, I have a sort of similar kind of cami that sounds a bit like that, but not a whole People negligee. used to talk about cami and cami knickers. What is a cami and what are cami knickers? It's a camisole. Cami knickers are... Yeah, why are they called cami? Because I have cami knickers. I actually do not know. People are going to be screaming... Uh, into their radios well, people or, or are the devices they're using. Of a certain vintage, because I don't think... Uh, these sound like costumes worn by people oh, in the well, 1920s. Oh, no, the original cami knickers I do not wear. An undergarment which combines a camisole and knickers yep. back in 1908. Yeah. Um, and in the Daily Mail of 1923, uh, people were writing about cami petticoats of heavy artificial silk stockinette. That's definitely not what I wear. Maybe I'm not wearing cami knickers. I think I wear... Well, why are we talking about my knickers? Let's, let's, go, let's move on. Or back to negligees. And negligee. Yes. Explain to me what a negligee is. Uh, well, a negligee is... I'm going to give you... I'm not going to get into this territory with what I wear, so I'm just going to explain well, I the see definition it. it's of a little, negligee. It's like a slip or an undergarment. It's quite revealing, it's a, it's isn't a, it? It's a revealing... Oh, she was in a, nothing but a, a negligee. OK, so it started off in the 18th century as a kind of loose gown worn by women. But then it became something that they would wear to be casual and presumably quite sensual. So we know what a negligee is. What was the other yes, word? Yes, so the idea negligent is just... It simply goes back to the idea that a woman donning such a casual outfit was ignoring the kind of quite elaborate conventions of the day. Yeah. That's really where, where that one comes from. Pupil and puppet. Pupil and puppet are connected in some way. Mm -hmm. Pupil, this being a person who is a, a child at school rather than a pupil of your eye. Yes, we'll come back to that, yes. And a puppet. Well, we know what a puppet is. I'm very into puppeteering. I love... I'm, actually, I, d I don't think I've ever left my childhood. I'm amazed I actually managed to turn up here in, in 2019, <laughs> 2020, because I'm still locked in the 1950s and 1960s. I'm, the moment you say puppet, I think of Punch and Judy yes. on the beach of Broadstairs. Oh. Oh. But it was so unsuitable. Punch and Judy. Oh, actually, uh, Mr. He Punch. was incredibly violent. He was. He was. Uh, he, uh, I mean, he abused his wife. He did. He, he had a huge stick, and most of the show was him chasing his wife, hitting poor Judy over the head. Yeah. They called the police. The police were useless. They accepted sausages as sort of bribes. Bags of mystery. You know, in fact, Punch and Judy kiosks are coming back. This is how I know Punch and Judy, because you will find some in, in a traditional seaside times. Anyway, I'll give you the connection, if anybody's still with us. Um, a puppet is um, sort of a little doll, and the, the pupilla in uh, Latin, oh. meant a little doll. Do you remember this? Because I think I've mentioned it before. Because in relation, you've mentioned it, in relation to butterflies. Of, oh. Is that possible? I think I've mentioned it in relation to the pupil of the eye, which right. I will come back to. But okay. pupils going to school, little children, uh, they were seen as, they were sort of diminutive beings, if you like, and so the pupils that go to school are then related to the puppets, which were little dolls. And the pupilla, the pupil of your eye, one of my favourite, favourite etymologies, which I'm sure I've not bored you with, hopefully entranced you with before because I think it's so beautiful, it gives me goosebumps. Um, the people of the eye so named because when you look into the eyes of someone else, you see a tiny little doll-like reflection of yourself. So that's pupilla, little doll. It's so mm. beautiful. I love that. Anyway, that, that's the link there. Where do I, have I been distracted by thinking there's something to do with when a butterfly is born before it's a butterfly it's a chrysalis yes and there is some pupillare word involved. a pupate pupate that's is that pupating um, is that anything to do with the it pupa that's a really really good question the pupa um and pupating are they have they have they are sort of slightly distant cousins i would say um i'll give you the the pupating definition in um the oed to change into a pupa or chrysalis um in german it's verpuppen which is lovely because um, puppen is a doll in german isn't it as well yeah so it does it goes it is definitely linked and it goes back to the idea of a, of a little being, if you like. So something that's in its embryonic stage. Hence, it's linked to the kind of girl or doll um, idea. Yeah. It's Learning. interesting that also that look, well. looking into one another's eyes and seeing the miniature version of yourself, so the pupil in another. And of course, yeah. that is what the beginning of a love affair always involves. Two people coming together and that conversation, you know, you think I'm me, I think I'm you. They're all looking into each other's eyes. Mm. 
but, and your pupils dilate. And your pupils dilate. But can I tell you, as an older person here, don't think that that will necessarily last. Mm -hmm. It can last. But Limerence it's, is it, the name for that. Oh, what? Not lasting? No, it's an infatuation, ah, a sudden infatuation with yeah. somebody. The limerence is the feeling, the exhilaration of falling in love with the sort of slight hint that it may not last. Yeah. And honeymoon also. Really? We need to do something on love and weddings, actually. We haven't oh, done love yet. Oh, we must. Honeymoon is the most cynical thing of, of the love. Oh, I'll I, save that. Let's do honeymoon. Let's go to let's rectums do, now. Uh, uh, thank you. Let's move um, straight to the rectum. Do you have any idea what rectitude and rectum have in common? Well, rect means right. And Correct. maybe as in right, as in upright as well, straight. Straight. Rectum and what was the other one? Rectitude. rectitude. So somebody who has rectitude is somebody who is very upright and very proper. Yep. And somebody who has, um, you know, something up the rectum is also <laughs> suddenly upright and proper. The, uh, well, no, it's is because... The, the rectum is part of your bottom. Yes. <laughs> isn't it? So... Unlike the curvaceous bit of your intestines, the small intestines, the rectum is the straight part of your bowel. So it's not oh. the cul-de-sac, which is near there. The original cul-de-sac was a part of the intestines that kind of literally is looped. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of like a dead end, if you like. Um, so it's not that the rectum is the straight part. So it all goes back to the idea of being straight, which reminds me of another thing. And forgive me for repeating all of my favourite things in this podcast, but um, it reminds me of the name for intestines in Anglo-Saxon times and a little bit after Anglo-Saxon times, the arse ropes, remember those? Oh, I love the arse ropes. They are. The intestines in, in Anglo-Saxon time. But sticking with rectum and rectitude, is rector, as in the new vicar, our rector? Yes. Is that the same connection? Yes, sorry, I was just looking up cul-de-sac, French for sack bottom or bag bottom. Uh, so it's the blind gut. Uh, that's what it's defined cul -de -sac. as. The cul-de-sac. And that's near the rectum, but the rectum is the straight part the straight. of your bowel system. Straight part, exactly. Um, so, yes, it is to do with... I'm looking at, at rector here. Um, it is all linked, um, but it's also linked to regent. Oh. So here we go. I have rector here. Um, I think there is an ancient link there with rectitude and rectum, uh, although most rectors won't be pleased to hear that. But actually, its its most direct ancestor is the Latin regere, meaning to rule, which gave us um, regent as well, or regere, depending how you pronounce it. Ah, uh, so there may be a loose connection, mm -hmm. but really rector is to do with being, as it were, in charge, the like the regent the person who's ruling. Exactly, the superior. The, the superior person running the yes. church is the rector, but yes. we hope he has rectitude and we have he has no problems with his rectum. Nothing's got <laughs> stuck in the cul-de-sac on its way to the rectum. Oh, Which... I've got one other I have to give you. OK, give us one more, then we must take a break. Yes. Or should we do it after the break? OK, let's get excited. It's worth staying tuned after the break because she's got something that is... Well, those goose... I can see the goosebunks. On goose... my biceps. Uh, on, on her biceps mice. beneath her negligee. We're talking double acts today on Something Rhymes with Purple. Do you have a favourite show business double act? Uh, one for my dad has to be Morecambe and Wise. Of course. Um, he used to just copy Eric Morecambe in so many, so many different ways, particularly the sort of whole glasses, you know, the way he used to move his glasses up and down his head. Uh, and do you remember that wonderful scene which my dad used to replay all the time and tell us about where uh, they're making breakfast oh, and to so the brilliant. music and they catch the toast Unbelievably. To, the, to the beat? It's brilliant. So, um, but in my time, I would say probably French and Saunders. Yeah. I think they are utterly brilliant. Yeah. Totally good. How about you? Well, I, I'm, Bracket, I'm going to choose my friends, Hinge and Brackett. Yeah. Why not? They were, but, I mean, I loved, of course, Morgan and Wise. I loved the two Ronnies. Oh, of I course. love French and Saunders. Of course. Uh, I love a double act. It's a very interesting phenomenon. And what is always fascinating to me about a double act is that it only works if both of them work. Mm -hmm. You know, people used to think that um, Ernie Wise was just the feed. But, in fact, if you see them together, mm. it's, he's indispensable. And it was the same with Hinge and Brackett. They occasionally did work separately. And... They together they were greater than the sum of their parts. Same as Laurel and Hardy. I mean, there are so many, aren't there? No, isn't it interesting? They were brilliant. They were clearly brilliant, but clearly their act was brilliant. Did you see the film last year or the year before? Oh, I have yet to see that, but I've heard it was astonishing. Really good. Yeah. Really yeah. good with Alan Partridge playing. Mm -hmm. I called him Alan Partridge. You know what I mean? It must be awful to be known by the character you play <laughs> no, rather than by your real that. name. Would he? I don't think he would necessarily love that. Anyway. Do you know? Yeah. What's he called? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The mind has gone blank. Steve Coogan. Steve Coogan. Steve Coogan. Steve Coogan. Um, well, we're talking about double acts in English, aren't we? And yep. just um, 
It's surprising siblings, uh, so things that you wouldn't necessarily share a past of some kind. There are just so many. Senate and senile, because the Senate goes back to Senex, meaning old man. There's one I must ask you about before we get on to the listeners' questions. Yoga and conjugal. Yoga and conjugal. Because it's such an unlikely combination. Yoga, we know about. We do. Though I'm not quite sure what the origin of yoga is. It's a kind of uh, meditation exercise, isn't it? Yes. And conjugal is to do with... Being a couple. joining giblets, as they used to call it, joining giblets. Yes. Is that the expression? I'll save that for the love one too. Okay, we have to do love soon. Okay, um, okay. So it's Sanskrit yoga, meaning the act of yoking, so joining. Um, and in Indian philosophy, it was the idea of joining uh, with the divine. So it was a spiritual union. So that's why yoga is linked to the act of conjugal, which is of course coming together and uniting in that way. Oh, okay. Can you give me just one more? Okay, Virago um, and werewolf. Virago, I'll tell you what, I'll give you two more very quick couplets. Virago and werewolf. Uh, well, werewolf goes back to um, V-I-R, ultimately, the Latin for a man, which gave us virile and also virtue, because virtue was um, originally associated with masculine oh. qualities rather than female ones. And a virago is a bad-tempered, vicious woman with very aggressive male-like qualities. So man is the link there. Sardine and sardonic. Sardonic first... Oh, sorry, what's the connection? with the werewolf? Uh, sorry, the werewolf, sorry. So we're, V-I-R became were, uh, oh. meaning man in Anglo-Saxon times. Oh, so a werewolf is, is a, a man-wolf. half wolf. man, half wolf. Very Sorry, good. hurrying along too Virago much. Virago and werewolf. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, sardine and sardonic. Sardines um, were um, originally fish that came from the island of Sardinia. Sardonic, that kind of grim, grimacing humour, if you like, uh, was first applied to the facial convulsions that were produced by eating a bitter plant grown on the island of Sardinia. Oh, the sardonic look. Yes. Susie, I want you to dip into our post bag now, but before you do, I wrote down on my way here from the underground, I passed the local health food shop. We're in N1 here. It's a blaze with health food shops. (laughs) And amusingly, it was the health food shop, and there was a notice in the window saying, closed due to illness. (laughs) Made me laugh anyway. It was the health food shop. Closed due to illness. That is good. What are the queries? Or not good. Um, The queries are, would you remember, uh, quite recently, we talked about the filler like really getting on people's nerves to the extent that one school put it in a word jail and I said I wasn't that keen I wasn't that fond with the idea of a word jail but it turns out our listeners feel exactly the opposite because they've come up with so many nominations for things that need to go into word prison one of which um one of whom is Timothy Ledger who's written in to say I have one word that needs putting in there get I always remember my English teacher saying this is a word which must never be used, although she gave no explanation. I suspect she just felt it was a pretty poor word. Uh, where do you stand on get, Giles? Oh, I would find it very irritating. I, we go to the, the pizza parlour and I say, oh, I'd love to have, or may I have, or I'd like to have the um, quattro formaggi. <laughs> and uh, my children and grandchildren are saying, oh, I'll get the Four Seasons. I'll get the this, I'll get that. What do you mean I'll get it? Well, if you want to get up and get it, you can. But it, the question is, I will have, I will get. Yeah, I think it's funny. I find I find it quite strange that people get very worked up at this because it's been with us, you know, almost forever, almost since the beginning of language. But I think the objection is that we use it too much instead of more precise verbs. I think that's, that's it the idea. People. Yeah. The only thing I would say is that um, some Shakespearean experts say that, and I wouldn't be able to, give you a a quote for this i need to find one but that shakespeare wasn't averse to using formulations similar to can i get a coffee although obviously he wasn't asking for a cappuccino but he used get in that way um so i i don't have a problem with get unless i suppose it is used in a very very lazy way um i certainly don't have a problem with gotten which is another thing that people hate and associate it very much with american english what about sat but it's not i would Uh, just say king james's bible shakespeare they used gotten and for me i really like it because it implies a process so he had gotten angry to me implies Uh. that he had steadily reached the point of real anger. He rather had than gotten he'd angry. got angry. Because, because once anything. you start saying it in a Shakespearean voice, it becomes mm. more acceptable. He had gotten angry. Sat, you mentioned. Yes. Sat. Oh, sat. He, he was sat there all that yeah. time. I know. He Do you was know what? My, um, uh, my 
yeah, I'm always quoting my poor youngest. Um, she does. She she loves language actually, and for her, she will simply say he was sat there. Uh, do you know well, what? Isn't it's, it more correct to say he was sitting there? It well. Correct. He was sitting there. Yes, it's been a regional variant for centuries and centuries and centuries. He was sat there. So unless you're going to knock dialect and say that dialect isn't legitimate English, I think you can say he was sat there. It's still non-standard, certainly for formal context. I wouldn't write it in an exam paper or to your bank manager if you still write to your bank manager. Uh, but it's not. It, it is. It is an acceptable variant. I you should say. be so lucky as to have a bank manager. I mean, for goodness' sake, does anybody know the name of their bank manager? Writing to their bank manager. I do. I know the name of mine. But oh, that's probably bad, that isn't is, it, if you know that, the name that, of your bank manager? No, it's good because it shows us how much money you must have. Oh, my goodness, They're the only, No, I'm sorry, they only take interest in people who are known now as high net worth individuals. Oh, it's not me. The I rest of us, I'm afraid... Oh, 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 <laughs> there, well, there may be reasons, other reasons, but the point is it isn't like it used to be. In the old days, and then this rant will stop, mm. but I'm just speaking up for the people who belong to the generation that don't like sat, don't like get, like the language to be traditional and precise and we loved it when there was a proper bank manager. Like in the you, Mary Poppins days. You could go and see this person, him or her. They would get to know you. They'd get to understand your circumstances. When my wife and I first bought our first flat, he actually, the bank manager, came in his little car to see that it was there before we got the money. And oh. if somebody knows and understands your finances, then, then they can give you a, a loan and, it's, and you don't get into problems like 2008 if people know what they're doing. So I am speaking up for the traditional bank manager. OK. There we are. I've had my rant, and now I would like to hear your trio. Three interesting words for us to put into our minds and keep. Well, if I was ungenerous, I might just accuse you of having brabbled. Brabbled? Brabble. Brabble, an old dialect word. Uh, I think it's born purely for its sound. To argue noisily about things that don't really matter. <gasps> oh. To brabble. I have to say, the bank manager issue does matter. Oh, OK. I'm, I'm, I'm blaming that no, crisis. I'm not saying bank managers themselves don't matter. I was just thinking we're getting slightly uh, over irate, if I may say so. Um, as a noun, it is also a petty quibble. A um, captious objection or dispute goes back to the 1500s. Well, it's a very good word. I have to say, I won't argue with that. I think brabbling is a good word. And I it am is. a bit of a brabbler because you're right. It doesn't really matter. Can I get, may I have? It doesn't really matter because you're still communicating clearly. Uh, and you, when you brabble, yes? you might be making yourself feel atrabilious. Now, I've heard of this word. OK. Atrabilious. Bilious means bilious, as in not feeling very pleasant. Yes, full what's of bile. The, what's the atraba? Um, atra, it's, it means... A-T-R-A, um, is it? Yes. It's from, uh, from, from the Latin, uh, as you might expect. Um, and it means full of black bile. So the definition is to be sullen, bad-tempered or a bit melancholy. Yeah. It's not worth it. It isn't worth it. And, you know, the black bile was this um, originally an imaginary fluid that was thick, black and acrid. And it was thought to be the cause of melancholy. And in fact, mela, the mela um, in melancholy is linked to melanoma and other things to do with black. It's all to do with blackness. And oh. melancholy was thought to be produced by this surfeit of black bile. Atrabilious, mm. suffering from black bile. Mm. Don't be atrabilious. Be happy. No, be bibulous. Be bib oh. Now, this doesn't apply to you at all. No, this is drinking. Given that you're a teetotal. Yes, to be bibulous is to be fond of alcoholic beverages. I can brattle without being bibulous. You can brabble. <laughs> brabble without being bibulous. Bibulous, um, bibulous, bibulous, bibulous brabbling is the worst. What is the origin of bibulous? Bibulous, the Latin bibere, meaning to drink. So, bibulous bra So, that's enough bibulous brattling. Oh, gosh, I can't even say it. That's enough bibulous brattling from us today. Don't be atrabilious. Be happy, as yes. the Dalai Lama says. Be happy. It's easier that way. This has been Something Rhymes with Purple. Do get in touch with us if you'd like to. It's a purple at something else without the G dot com. And uh, this production, well, a <laughs> production, I use the language loosely, almost as loosely as my friend Susie Dent does. It was produced by Paul Smith with additional production from Lawrence Bassett, Steve Ackerman and... Gully! Hey. Is he a puppet or is he a pupil? <laughs> I must say, you look really good in that negligee. <laughs>